I'm, I'm, I'm about to preach. I got a word for you. Um, it's been a, been a great week, and we married uh, two of our staff. Sammy and Caitlin got married last night, and just amazing uh, time of celebration together. Uh, they had just been so committed to the Lord, committed to each other, committed to purity. Uh, it, was, it was a party last night, uh, uniting them uh, in marriage, and so I got just a, a fresh word. I was a little tired. Um, it was late last night, and I got up early this morning. I like the early mornings. I got up early, but I wasn't quite awake, and so I was driving on the way here this morning, and I was doing a couple things in my car, and I drifted across a couple lanes, not realizing it because my head was down. I was not being a responsible driver. At that time in the morning, there's no cars on the road except for one, one lone police officer that was next to me trying to escape my drifting car. So he quickly pulled me over, and uh, we had a little chat this morning. I said, sir, I'm a pastor. <laughs> yes, I used that. I pulled that car. I said, I just married a couple in our church last night, late last night, out in Decatur, out in devil territory. I mean, I God doesn't even live out there. I came all the way back, and I'm on my way to the house of God this morning. Praise the Lord. He said, God bless you, sir, and let me go. There is a God. I tell you what. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm ready to preach this morning. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 through 8. We're going to be reading together. Uh, this is the second part of our series, We Can't Stay Here. And so I, I believe that everything that God does in you is not for the place that you're in now. Everything God does in you where you're at now is only to move you to another place and so that you're prepared when you go there. You ever found that out? That God never gives you what, you, what, gives you, what you want where, you at, where you're at. He always gives you what you need where you're at for the next season he's about to take you in. Matthew chapter 17. I, mean, I feel something this morning. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 through 8 says, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain. If you know anything about me, you know that I love mountains. And led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You know who this is, right? This is our friend Peter. He's always the one speaking up. He's always the one commenting, and here he goes again. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, with whom, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except for Jesus. That'll preach right there. When they looked up, they saw no one except for Jesus. Can I just tell you, if you can't see anyone in your life, but you can still see him, you are doing all right. When you can't see anything but storm and anything but opposition and anything but difficulty, if you can still see him, you're going to be all right. When we talk about the Mount of Transfiguration, a lot of people don't preach on this, and honestly, I haven't. I think this is the first time I've actually in my life ever preached this text. And I can't say that about too many texts, too many passages of Scripture, but it's the first time I preach uh, this text. And as I've studied this, I've been lost all week as I've studied this over and over. I'm going to try to give you some things, but I need you to put on your thinking caps this morning because I want to show you some symbolism in the Mount of Transfiguration that will set you free in your personal pursuit of Jesus Christ. Everything in our life that is spiritual needs to be made practical. And everything that is practical needs to be made spiritual. Where there's been a disconnect between the church and the world is that the things that were spiritual were segregated to that which is spiritual and the things that were practical were segregated to that which is practical. What God wants to do in New, Test New Testament church and New Testament Christianity is make everything that's spiritual practical and everything that's practical spiritual. That means that if you're so spiritual that you can't get practical You've got to readjust some things. Or if you're so practical that you can't get spiritual and you don't need God, then you have to adjust some things. 
the spiritual must be practical, and the practical must be spiritual. We're talking about the subject we can't stay here. I was, I was thinking back, and when my, my firstborn son Jude was small, we were, we were going on a walk, and he had just learned how to walk. You know, So it's the, it's the you want them to walk, but you're also waiting for them to fall. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, we're going to let you go, but after you get those bruises, we can't take you up in, out in public anymore because they're going to judge me. And uh, so, you know, he's toddling around, and he stepped right in an anthill, a red, red ant, anthill. And uh, I'm, from, I'm from Washington. You know, it's like you can walk outside and don't get eaten up by things, but here, I mean, they'll carry you off. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's out of control. It's like we just stay inside and watch them from the outside now and just wave. But we, she steps in this anthill. And these ants, this little kid, I mean, just these ants swarm him all the way up, up his body. So as a dad, like, I, I grab him and I pulled him as close and as tight as I could to myself to squash all of these red ants. And I'm just, I'm hitting them. I'm swiping them off him. And, of course, as I squeeze him to me, they're just, like, destroying me. And so we are running. I mean, it must have been a great scene. Uh, we are running down the pathway by our house, and I'm like, ah! as these things are literally eating me alive. But I did feel like somewhat of a hero as I'm saving my son's life. So we limp in the house, and he's got bites all over his legs. I got bites all over my face and my chest. And uh, I'm like, Jamie, I saved our son today. You know, felt good. Felt, felt good uh, until later. It's just like they kept on hurting. And it's just like those ant bites, they just get at you. You know what I thought was interesting? As soon as we got bit, there was no way that we were staying there. We took off immediately. As soon as the pain hit us, we were gone. I mean, you, you, you couldn't have kept us there because that's where the pain was inflicted. As soon as we touched there and the pain hit us, we were gone. And I think this is so interesting that when physical pain hits us, there's no way that we can stay there. But oftentimes, emotional pain in our life draws us into a cycle, a victim mentality, where we stay in the cycle of pain even though we can feel it hurting us. I think it's interesting. You, may, you burn your finger on the stove and you pull back. You can't stay there. But it's interesting. Sometimes spiritually and emotionally, we get caught into cycles that we know are hurting us and know are bad for us, but we'll stay in that cycle. And I want to declare from the outset this morning that you can't stay there anymore. You can't stay there anymore. God's call's too big. The assignment on your life is too great. You can't stay there. I know you like what you're into, but the pain of that needs to be felt so that you can leave it. It's time to leave what you've been in. You can't stay where you've been. You can't just build a memorial and talk about what hurts you three years ago. It is time to move on. You can't stay in the offense. You can't stay in that unforgiveness. You can't stay there. You've got to move on. We can't stay here. And when you're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, it's interesting because Jesus in Matthew 16, we're in Matthew 17, in 16, just a page before it, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this is where he has a conversation with Peter, and we preached about this. He's having this conversation with Peter, and he's saying, who do people say that I am? And he says, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. And Jesus begins to dive in deeper, as he always does. And he says, yeah, but who do you say that I am? I want to know about you. Who do you say that I am? Scholars will tell you, and, and they believe that it, was, that it was Peter, James, and John. Peter was the one who spoke up naturally. But it was Peter, James, and John that declared to Jesus in that moment that you are the Messiah. You are the one that was promised, you are the one who was prophesied about, and you are the sent of God. It was in that moment, theologians will tell you, that there was a shift fundamentally and theologically in their own minds and their own ideologies that Jesus was no longer just a prophet, he was no longer just a rabbi, but he now is the sent of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And based on that revelation, we go to Matthew 17. In Matthew 17, to set the stage for you, all the disciples are there, but Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and he leaves the others. So they've had this conversation, and these three have made this declaration of faith, and on their declaration of faith, Jesus says, come on, I want to show you something. 
And Jesus goes up high on a mountain. You should study every mountain in your Bible. Every mountain in your Bible is significant. Jesus climbs up on the mountain. He takes them with him, which is amazing. It's actually a sign of leadership, a great display of leadership, is that Jesus didn't go on the mountain alone. He actually said, I'm going to bring you with me, and I'm going to bring the people who have already made a declaration of faith to me that I am what they say, what I say I am, so I'm going to bring them with me. So James, Peter, John, let's go. And they went up, the Bible says, the text says, high on the mountain. And as they're up there and they're high on the mountain, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. Now, i got to give you some of this, and if you just hold on, I'm going somewhere this morning. But i gotta, I got to give you this. I've been stuck in this all week. But Moses and Elijah show up. Why Moses and Elijah? Why did Moses and Elijah show up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? What happened? Why? And if you think about this and you think about these thoughts, it's so interesting that Moses represented the law. And Elijah represented the prophets. So there's Jesus standing on the Mount of Transfiguration with the law and the prophets. Now, if you know anything about your Bible, this is very symbolic that these two would be standing with him. Because Moses, he was a, he was a mountain dweller himself. Moses was on mountains all the time. In Exodus chapter 33, we find this. Moses was the one that gave the law. He was the one that presented the law that you got to do these things in order to be holy. you got to do these things in order to be accepted. So this is the ideology that people understood and believed in that time is God was a God who commanded. He was a God who commanded. He was a God that wanted something from me, that needed something from me, a certain behavior, a certain standard, a standard that we know that we cannot attain to and that we cannot reach. But that was all by design because the law was supposed to bring us to the understanding that we need a Savior. The law was designed to make us stumble so that we would see that we need to be saved. So there's Moses there in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 through 22. you got to be patient because you're going to love this. In, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18, it says, Then Moses said, on, on the mountain, high on the mountain. Exodus 32 says he climbs high on the mountain to meet with God. Verse 18 says, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Can you imagine that? Just all the goodness of God to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have, will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft. Or another translation might say, in a cave. In the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Now, you got to catch this. If you don't understand it, it's all right. I'm going to explain it to you in a second. Moses is on the mountain. He climbs high on the mountain. Jesus climbed high on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, Mount Transfiguration. Now, Moses is high on the mountain. He says, show me your glory. God says, I will show you my glory, but I'm going to put you in a cave. And when you're in that cave, I'm going to cover you with my hand, and I'm going to allow my glory to pass by you. I'm going to allow it to pass by you. And it was on that mountain that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. This was the second time because the first time he broke them when he came back and found the Israelites in sin. So now this is the second time, and Moses receives something on the mountain that he then takes down to the valley. Now you have to catch this, is that whatever God gives you on the mountaintop of experience is always needed in the valley of living. Where you live at is in the valley. You don't live in the mountain. I don't live on the mountain. We visit the mountain to meet with God. What is the mountain? The mountain is your meeting place. The mountain is your closet. The mountain is the place where you meet with God. The mountain is the place of consecration. The mountain is the place where you climb above this shallow world and shallow living and get up on a higher plane with a higher perspective. I've noticed this, that altitude changes my perspective. That the higher I get... The, dif the, 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 the difference that is affected on what I see is vast. That something that looks large in the valley can look small from the mountain. It's interesting that when you begin to climb a mountain with God, you begin to get away with God. What looked large when you woke up that morning looks really small when you start walking with God. 
And so it was on the mountain that God gave Moses a download of Ten Commandments that he brought down the mountain to the valley to the rest of the people. God hides Moses in the cave. He gives Moses the law to give to the people. Moses gave us the belief that someday God would give us one true sacrifice or one tr true propitiation, one true person or someone to pay the price. Moses brought the people into belief in sacrifice. Because he showed them how through animal sacrifice that there would be forgiveness of sins. Now, you got to catch this. Some of you are like, this is a little deep this morning. It's all right. We're, we're going to come back up for air in just a second. You, you, you got to get this because if you don't catch this, the rest doesn't matter. you got to see this is that Moses taught the people that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So Moses taught the people and they learned that somehow in the future there might possibly be one true sacrifice that would then pay the price for all those sins. And I'll just tell you that many believers, they have never moved past this understanding. That God is just commanding. They've never moved past the idea that God just wants you to obey and that's it. There was no relationship with people and God. There was a relationship with Moses and God. But the people just had to obey the commands. And many people never move past this understanding of who God is. Elijah. Why is Elijah up there? Elijah, it's interesting, is Elijah brought hope. Elijah represented the prophets, and the prophets would prophesy that there would be a Messiah who would come. A sacrifice would be one sacrifice for all men. And the prophets begin to spread hope that someday there would be a fulfillment. And someday you wouldn't have to offer sacrifices as we did in the past. But there would be one true sacrifice, blood shed for all. And so Elijah represented this. And it's interesting in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. Elijah is there after the battle at Mount Carmel, and it says, So he got up and drank, ate and drank, strengthened by that food he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Elijah found a mountain. Then he went into a cave, and he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You can't stay here. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too, Elijah said. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Moses, in Exodus chapter 33, on the mountain in the cave, and the Lord passed by. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19, on the mountain, in the cave, and the Lord was about to pass by. Both receiving vision, both receiving instruction, both receiving promise, both receiving hope that they would take off the mountain into the valley to give to the people of God. Mount Sinai was the mountain that Moses climbed. Mount Horeb was the mountain that Elijah climbed. Theologians will tell you it was the same mountain and the same cave. That Moses, so many years earlier, was in a cave when the glory of God passed by. And when Elijah ran to the mountain in 1 Kings chapter 19, it was in the same cave. And now, fast forward to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's Jesus up there with Peter, James, and John. And all of a sudden... Moses shows up. The law. All of a sudden, Elijah shows up. The prophets. And this is when Peter, he can't help himself, and he says, all right, all right, this is too good. This is good. This is good. Law, prophets, Jesus. We're staying right here. We're building the shelter. Let's go, people. We're staying right here. I will never go down in that godforsaken valley again. I'm staying right here. This, this is where it's at. Glory of God shining, the clouds bright. You know what's really interesting is the cloud that led the people of Israel by day was not a bright cloud. If you read, it was a dark cloud. But on the Mount of Trans, because the law brought fear and darkness. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says it was a bright cloud. Clouds shifted. 
what used to be dark begin to be illuminated in Jesus. And now Jesus is there, and, and, and Peter's like, I'll take you all. Like, I want all three of you. And as soon as he began to speak, the Bible says that the cloud came and Moses and Elijah disappeared. And the voice of God began to thunder over Jesus saying, this is my son. This is the man. This is the one that is sent. This is the one that is promised. You know what God was saying? He was saying that in my son Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets. You don't have to live as God commanded. You don't have to live. Live with just hope of the future. You can live in the fulfillment of Jesus right now. I want you to know that many believers have been stuck in Moses' theology. Trying to just do the rules. Do the thing. You ever ask someone, hey, are you a Christian? I'm a a good person. So, are you going to go to heaven? I'm a good person. No, your goodness has nothing to do with your Christianity. It, it, it's about the Mount of Transfiguration. It's about what is fulfilled in Jesus. You can be, there are really good people, hear me on this, there are really good people that will be in hell. That's, that's heavy, I know. There are really good people that will be in hell because your goodness is not what gets you into heaven. It is your faith in the Son of God. It is your belief in the one that was sent. Now this is interesting. You have Moses and Elijah and Jesus there as the fulfillment. Let me read this to you. Every acceptable sacrifice of the Mosaic economy was made acceptable through the sacrifice of Christ. Every hope kindled by the prophets found its fulfillment in him. If you know anything about Old Testament theology is that people yearned for the coming of the Messiah. They yearned that someday a deliverer would come. And this is what the Mount of Transfiguration is all about. Jesus takes the people who had made a statement, a declaration of faith onto a mountain. And he says, you can handle this because you believed before you saw. So let's go. He takes them up on the mountain and there on the mountain is Moses and Elijah and Peter's like, yeah, this, this is good. And Jesus says, no. This is not good. And Moses and Elijah disappear, and the favor of God, the bright cloud, shines upon Jesus. And God the Father begins to share and to begin to speak, saying, This is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. See, Moses and Elijah were servants. Jesus was a son. That's a huge difference. That's a huge difference. Moses and Elijah served the purpose of God. Jesus was the purpose of God. That is a huge difference. Jesus was the fulfillment of every law and the fulfillment of every hope. You don't have to keep hoping for a future salvation. I'm here to announce to you today on 9-11 that Jesus is the hope and Jesus is here. It's not a future salvation. It's not a salvation for next week or next month. It is here And now, it's Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the salvation of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. It's interesting that when Moses came down from the mountain, the Bible says that his face shone. That he had seen the glory of God. So when he came down the mountain, his face was so bright, the Bible says that they had to put a veil over his face because he had seen God. And because the glory had passed by him in the cave, the glory that had shone on him now reflected from him. And this is why people revered Moses and were in awe of Moses because he saw God and he did not die. He was a friend of God and reflected his light. But this is what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, what was once a reflection of the light. Now Jesus appeared as the light. Jesus was not a reflection. Jesus is not a mirrored image. Jesus is not a reflection of what once was or what will be. Jesus is the light. John chapter 8 verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Mount of Transfiguration was Jesus saying, you don't have to just look at reflections anymore. You can find fulfillment in me. So how does that translate to us? How does, it, how does practical become spiritual and spiritual become practical as we talk about the law and the prophets and Jesus and the fulfillment of prophecy and the fulfillment of hope? I, I want to just give you these three things as we begin to wind down that 
I think will help you because to make the spiritual practical, you got to understand that God wants to encounter you. That God wants to show you his glory. God wants to show you his power. God wants to reveal himself to you. God wants to have your relationship with him not be one that is commanded and not be one that is a hope for a future salvation. He wants it to be a daily relationship as you walk with him. A daily relationship, life full of fullness and joy. Not a future joy, a joy right now. Not a future hope. But a, see, Elijah was everything was future. Moses was everything to do. But Jesus said, I am. Period. That's it. Everything that you need. The Bible says he's given you everything you need for life and for godliness. Everything that you need is found in him. So let me say this. God encounters require steps of faith. God encounters require steps of faith. It was Peter, James, and John who declared you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, come on. I'm going to show you something. And what they had believed in faith in the valley, God showed them as fact on the mountain. Every God encounter starts with you and I taking a simple step of faith. So let's just bring it back down, just practically. Like, what does this mean for us? That's great stuff. But what does it mean for us? It means that, that in every day, every day walk of life, your work, your family, you got to take a step of faith towards God. Because you encountering God is dependent on your step of faith towards him. The Bible teaches us that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. Cameron already said it, is that all we need to receive from God is to come to him. But we were singing on the opposite side that God is coming to us. This is the beauty of Jesus, is now we don't have to do these things to get to him. Now when we come towards him with our messed up, with our mistakes, with our past, he comes towards us in a beautiful intersection of our desire for God and his desire for us. The disciples believed in faith before they saw in fact. They believed in faith before they saw in fact. I want to challenge you to believe in faith again. I want to challenge you to stir your faith up and believe. Do you know what faith is? Faith is believing something that you cannot see. It's hope in something that God's shown you that you can't see the fruit of yet. It's believing for that salvation of a, of a friend. It's believing for that son or that daughter. It's believing for that healing. It's believing in faith, even when everything is standing against it. In fact, I got, a great, I got great news for you, that the word of God trumps facts. Truth always trumps facts. God encounters require steps of faith. Second thing is God encounters happen on the mountain. God encounters happen on the mountain. You learn this in the life of Moses. If Moses was willing to go up the mountain, God was always willing to come down. I just want you to know that God wants you to live in such a vibrant relationship with him that is not all about doing and not all about hoping, but really about living, about walking with him. People ask me all the time, well, hey, Pastor, I don't really know how to pray. Praying is talking. It's talking to God. If you don't know how to pray, get a worship album, worship song, put it on, and whatever the words say in the song, pray those words. They're usually pretty good. I'm going to be saying some today. It is well with my soul. Isn't it nice to know that it is well with my soul, that it's not about my perfection? Otherwise, we'd all be in trouble. It's not about my good works or my good deeds because we all mess up. It's not about me being loving all the time because we would all be in trouble. It's about God's grace and my acceptance of that grace, and my acceptance, and my declaration of faith, even when I can't see it. To, to, to encounter God, you have to learn how to climb the mountain. What is the mountain? The mountain is your own secret place with God. I don't know what it looks like for you. Maybe it's in your car on the way to work. Maybe it's in your study before you leave for work. Maybe it's at night after the kids go down. But you've got to find some sanctuary. You've got to find some safe place that you can call your climbing place. That you get into that prayer closet and you climb the mountain and you be with God. God, well, I don't know how. I don't know if I can pray for an hour. Take 15 minutes and just focus on God. Talk with him. Talk with him. Some of, I've seen people just fill out pages of a journal but then say they can't pray. The Bible says don't worry about anything but pray about everything. You know what prayer is? Taking your worries and bringing them to God. 
instead of just writing them in a book that can't do anything about it, why don't we present them before a God that can change any impossible situation? He is the God of the impossible. He specializes in impossible situations. If Moses was willing to go up, God was always willing to come down. I'm going to tell you this. If you're willing to get alone with Jesus, he's going to be willing to get away with you. God encounters happen on the mountain. And lastly, God encounters are given for the valley. I want to give you this, and I've been, waiting, I've been waiting this entire message for these last five minutes. Because I thought, this, this rocked my world this week. Because I'm studying the Mount of Transfiguration. I'm looking at it all week, and uh, I see all these things. And I kept on reading. I read Matthew 17, and, and uh, through the Mount of Transfiguration, and I kept on reading down the chapter, and I saw something. I saw something so interesting. Is that Peter said, hey, let's stay here, Jesus. This is so good. I mean, this is amazing. You're here. Elijah's here. Moses is here. What more can we ask for? Let's just stay right here. And Jesus was in no hurry to stay. It was almost as if he was on assignment. It was almost as if he had a mission. It was almost as if he couldn't even take too much time on that mountain because he had to get back to the valley. And I just want you to know that everything that God gives you on the mountain is never for the mountain. It is always for the valley. Many believers try to get up on a mountain and stay there. And they just float around trying to be all spiritual. I'm going to tell you, you are no good to anybody if you cannot bring what God gave you down to the valley. When Moses was on the mountain, it did no good for him to look down at the people and judge them for not hearing the word that God gave him on the mountain. They weren't where he was. So Moses had to come down so that he could minister what God gave him. Do you know what happens a lot of times is Christians try to minister down. And that's why the world won't listen. Nobody wants to be talked down to. If you're going to minister to people in the valley, you've got to get in the valley. You're not beyond pain. You're not beyond failure. You're not beyond mistakes. Yet the church somehow in some way is the first one to point the finger of judgment at people. And I'm just saying it ought not be. It should be that we get down in the valley and say, I'm with you. I've made those mistakes. I've had those challenges. I have went through those things. But I'm down here with you. I'm not up here looking down at you. I'm down here with you. But while I'm down here, God gave me something while I was up there. That I wanted to give to you. See, this is what happened is Jesus starts coming down the mountain. He says, come on, Peter, get up. What are you doing over there? Peter, come on. Let's go. And they start going down the mountain. As they're coming down the mountain, they are met with a demon-possessed boy. Matthew chapter 17. And the rest of the disciples that did not go up the mountain, the boy's father says, these disciples couldn't cast the demon out. I hope that connects with somebody. There were nine disciples. Nine disciples that stayed, that did not climb a mountain. And while they were up there on the mountain meeting with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, the disciples were down here failing in ministry. But when Jesus came down from the mountain fresh with the voice and the anointing of God, he said, how long am I going to have to put up with y'all? to be healed in the name of Jesus and the boy was immediately set free see everything that God gives you on the mountain its purpose is for the valley Jesus if he didn't understand that he had a mission in the valley he would have said okay let's let's just stay here sure Peter build us a couple houses let's just stay here but Jesus says no 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 you got to understand my assignment is not to be a mountain dweller I receive empowerment from the mountain, but my mission is in the valley. See, many believers think that the mountaintop is the escape, but it's actually your empowerment. The mountain is not for your escape. Well, let's just get to church, get all the, the holy saints together and just keep the world out, keep the evil out, keep the uncleanness out, keep the perversity out. Gosh, let's all try. No, hold on till Jesus comes. No, it's for the people of God to get alone with God to meet with God, to grow in relationship with God, and then to go in the valley and be like Peter and John when they looked at the man at the gate out the gate called Beautiful, and they said, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I got from the mountain, 
I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I'm telling you, you can't stay where you are because you have an assignment that is in the valley. You can't stay here. You can't camp here. You can't build a house here. We have built shelters over doing Christianity, of hoping Christianity, and we have, fors- we have forsaken living Christianity. I got to do good, do good, do good. I didn't do good. Now God's mad at me. God, I'm hoping, hoping someday he'll deliver me. Someday he'll set me free. Someday. And, and we have forgotten that everything was fulfilled in Jesus. And if you would get alone, I'm, I'm telling you, if you would take 10 minutes out of your day and spend with Jesus and have some mountain time, he would actually give you some ammo to take back to that valley valley battle because many of you have been losing in the valley because you've never climbed the mountain and if you would start climbing the mountain and get dressed and get equipped then you could come down in the valley and actually be what God's called you to be your mission is not to live on a mountain looking down at people who have never climbed before your mission is to get on a mountain and get empowered and get down in the valley and love on people and give them silver and gold have I none but what I got last night I give you, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The mountain is meant for empowerment, not for escape. I tweeted this this weekend. The real battle isn't fought on the mountaintop of blessing and privilege, but in the valley of sickness and oppression. The real battle, it's it's not fought. When we're all in the good times, anybody can serve God when you got enough money in your bank account and all your kids are serving Jesus. The battle is fought fought in the valley of sickness and oppression, or in other words, when crisis hits your house. Anybody can serve God when things are good, but it takes faith to serve Him when things are bad. And just like the disciples, with Jesus when Peter said you're, you're, you're the Messiah it was a statement of faith to a fact that he had not seen but as soon as he made the statement of faith Jesus says come on I'm going to take you on a little journey and I just want to declare over some of you that you have been standing in faith for a long time and God wants to take you on a journey he wants to take you up to a mountain top where he can show you the fact of what you've been believing for in faith and I just I'm believing as a church as we learn how to climb as we learn how to get on the mountain top with God that he would equip us with tools and with love and with practical insight of how to get on the valley and actually reach people not judge people not condemn people not just not not disciple people in our own way or our own method but to really be the hands and feet of Jesus and love people you know what's really interesting in the end of Matthew and I'll close the end of Matthew somebody comes to Jesus and he says what's the most important commandment what is the most important I mean the most important And he says, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then watch this. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. All wrapped up in wrapped up in the embodiment of love himself. Jesus. All this hangs all the Moses, all the Elijah is embodied in Jesus and he says love the Lord your God with all your heart and this second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Bundle down into this. Love the God, love the Lord your God on the mountain and love the people in the valley. That's our mission. That's it. That's it. We can get all off on theology. We can get all off on when Jesus is going to come back, if he's going to come back, if he's going to come back for the church, pre-wrath, pre-trib, post-trib, pan-trib. it all pan out in the end. Whatever you believe, I'm telling you, we've got to get focused on this. Love Jesus and love his people. Live with Jesus. Encounter Jesus. But love his people. On this hangs all the law on the prophets. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?